Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We are grateful that you have chosen to worship with us on tonight. We're asking that you share this video and start a watch party with your family and friends. We have come to you this night for no other reason but to uplift the name of Jesus because he is so worthy to be praised. Our scripture comes from Matthew 4, 1 through 10. And it reads, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and nights, 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God. Next the devil took him to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, Satan said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get thee out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and only and serve him. You must worship God only. Our song is, we have come to worship. We have come into this house together. Together in his name and worship. 
Father God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus the Christ we come. Lord, we thank you for another chance to pray. We thank you, Father God, for blessing our lives and keeping us. We thank you for giving us a heart to worship you, a mind to keep you near and dear to us. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us with another privilege, another honor, Father God, to study your word. We ask you, Father God, to bless us as we study your word. Bless us and speak to us today, Father God, that our lives will be made the better, that men, women, boys, and girls will know you, and that people will give their lives to Christ. We ask you, Father God, to keep us now. Be with us to this time of Bible study. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. To worship him. Yes, yes, yes. Forget about yourself. Concentrate on him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, we've come to worship Jesus Christ our Lord. He has given us another privilege, another opportunity, and another chance to worship, to worship him. Amen. For our Bible study tonight, we are in, again, Colossians chapter 1. We're in Colossians chapter 1 again on tonight. We're in Colossians chapter 1. And we're glad that God has given us another privilege and another chance to come and worship him and study his word. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad, aren't you glad that God has given us another privilege to study his word? We're in Colossians chapter 1 <clears throat> on tonight, and we'll be looking at uh, verses number 9 through 12. Verses number 9 through verse number 12. Verses number 9 through 12 is where we will be tonight. The greater part of this pericope, the word pericope means uh, one key thought, one main thought, so the greater part of this pericope is found in verses 9 through 14. This total pericope is found through verses 9 through 14. But I dare tell you tonight we won't make it that far in this short period of time on tonight. So we're going to look at verses 9 through 12. 9 through 12 is where we will land on tonight. And we'll see how God will speak to us through this, his word. We find the Apostle Paul writing again here tonight, and as he's writing, he's writing to the church at Colossae. As he writes to this church at Colossae, in the first eight verses, he deals with the fact that Jesus Christ is the fruit. He is the fruit, and he talks about this church and how this church has been giving off fruit, the fruit of Jesus Christ. And because this church has been giving off fruit, Epaphroditus, or Epaphroditus, we believe he is the fellow worker of, of Paul, the Apostle Paul. He is saying <clears throat> he is saying good things about this church. I want to stop right here and ask you, is there anybody saying any good things about you and your church? You know, no church is any stronger than every single member. No church is stronger than the weakest member. So my question to you today, are you the weak link? My other question to you is, uh, are you the one hindering your church from being a loving church? Are you the one who is hindering your church from being a loving church? My next question is, are you the one that's hindering your church from being a faithful church? This church at Colossae was a faithful church. The members were faithful. They were faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul even says that Epaphras was a faithful servant unto the Lord. He was a faithful minister of the Lord. It's a shame when preachers, ministers, cannot be faithful to the Lord. How can we expect the people of God to be faithful to God if the preachers, the ministers, are not faithful to God? God deliver me from ministers that are not faithful to God. What are you talking about, preacher? Those who will make sacrifice for the kingdom. Those who will make sacrifice for the kingdom. We have to be sacrificial in our Christianity. If the Lord 
is going to be pleased with us. We have to walk faithful to him. And the, the, the root word for faithful is faith. In other words, you have to be faithful. And the only way you can be faithful is that you walk in faith. The reason why people don't walk in faith is simply because they have no faith or they have little faith. And they begin to quote stuff like this, saying, said, Jesus says you, can, you only need the faith the size of a mustard seed. Well, if you've been in Christ any time, your faith ought to be bigger than a mustard seed right now. And if your faith is bigger than a mustard seed, and Jesus says all you need is the faith of a mustard seed, then you ought to be moving many mountains, Amen. not just some mountains. Your prayers ought to be shaking up major mountains. Yeah, you ought to be faithful. First of all, you ought to have faith in order to be faithful. Secondly, you ought to be consistent in your worship to the Lord. That's what faith was all about. You see, when you walk in faith, you trust God. Trust God. And you show your trust toward God by what you do. And we're going to find out in verses 9 through 12 in, first, in, in, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. We're going to paint this picture tonight. And we're going to see coming right from the pages of the word of God that you need to be faithful. Every husband needs to be faithful. Every wife needs to be faithful. Every friend needs to be faithful. Certainly, every member of God's church ought to be faithful. Let me just tell you, because we're not meeting together, because we're not coming together in one place, we still ought to be faithful. Amen. Because we're coming together from a remote location, we still have to be faithful. Yes. I used to ask, I used to ask, uh, one time I asked, I asked the preacher, why is it that you can take up more money when you pass the basket around than you can when the people come up and drop the money in the basket? I thought that people, and, and I was a little naive, I thought that people would give the same amount regardless if a preacher or a deacon comes around and pick up the money. But they told me, they told me when, when you get there, when, when you get there to the person and you hand them the basket, they tend to give more than when they walk around the basket. Well, that's a problem. That's a problem with faithfulness. It's a problem with faithfulness simply because we ought to be about giving to the Lord and faithful in our giving to the Lord, even if nobody else is watching. That's right. We ought to look for a way to give to the Lord. We ought to look for a way to be committed to the Lord. We ought to look for a way to do things that God has called us to do. And we ought not have people watching over us. I say to the people at the New Beginning Church, I'm not here to enforce the law. I'm just here to deliver the law. I'm not here to watch you and, and plead for you to give to the Lord and, 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 and make sure that you give on a regular basis. It is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that causes you to be faithful in your service faithful in your giving, and faithful in your attendance. Amen. It says much about our walk with the Lord when we're not faithful. So Paul says that Epaphras, this is verse number 11, Epaphras has given us word that you have been faithful. And he says, he has declared, he has declared to us that you are faithful in your love in the spirit of God. You ought to be faithful in your love toward people. Your love toward other people ought to be gone, go, ought to go about unblemished. We have to be faithful. Because let me tell you, people know when you're faking love. People know when you're giving them a church hug or a church bump and you move on. People know when you're not carrying yourself the right way and you're just on display. Mm -hmm. Many people have come to the conclusion that they're not going to church anymore because there's too many fake people there. Well, I want to tell you one thing about it. I saw some fake people the other day at, at Sam's Warehouse. I saw some pay, fake people at Kroger's. I saw some pay, fake people at the dollar store and you're still going. 
So don't let, uh, don't let ungodly people, don't let unfaithful people keep you from a faithful God. Don't let people who are just as big as sinners as you are keep you away from a sinless God. We have to walk with God and we have to walk with him in faithfulness regardless of what other folk do. So Paul says, Paul says to this church at, at Colossae, he says to them that you have shown forth your love in the spirit. In verse number nine of first uh, Colossians chapter one uh, of this first verse, verse number nine, verse number nine, the first chapter rather, he says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard, he's saying, because you have a reputation, because you have a custom, because you have an identity of being faithful in your love in the spirit, he says, we heard of it. Let me tell you, regardless of where you go to church or where you don't go, people are going to hear about you. And see, that's why we, we as preachers can't lie for people when they're dying, when they're dead. See, the re reputation of the world in which we live, especially the church world, is that when you're living, folk will lie on you. When you're dead, folk will lie for you. I just want to say to you, you ought not want anybody to lie for you after you're dead and gone. Yes. Your sermon ought to be preached every single day of your life. Your testimony ought to be real every single day of your life. And when they come to the church, to the cemetery, and the, your hands are folded in service for the very last time, your, uh, your congregation, your members of your church, your friends and family ought to say, there lies one that was faithful. Paul says they had a a reputation of being faithful. And because of that, for this reason, for this cause, what cause? Because they had love in the spirit. They had love for each other. They had love for the visitors. And they had love for the people in the community. We ought to love people. We ought to love people. It's going to take us loving people to Christ. It's going to take us getting to a point in our lives where people can feel our love. Back home in Mississippi, they would say it like this. We have love for one another that runs from heart to heart and breast to breast. We love each other. And, and we, ought to, we ought to always love each other. He says, since that day that we heard of it, we did not cease to pray for you. The church ought to be praying for the church. <laughs> It doesn't matter what church you attend, but the church ought to be praying for the church. Yes. Church members, born-again believers, ought to be praying for born-again believers. Don't stop praying for me because I got saved. I really need you to continue to pray for me. Paul is saying, uh, we did not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Let me unpack all that. What Paul has, says now, has said now, Paul has said, we have, not con we have not ceased from praying for you. We have not stopped praying for you. We have been continually praying for you. We've been praying for you to the point that we pray for you morning, noon, and at night. We ought to pray for one another, saints. During these times, we ought to be in prayer for each other. We, we ought to call our names out, names of our friends out, call the family member's name out before the Lord. We ought not cease from praying for one another, and certainly we can't cease from praying for the church. The church needs prayer. The church needs us to continue in prayer. He says, we have not ceased from praying for you, we have asked God to fill you with all knowledge. We have asked God to fill you. Now, when you pray, this word pray is, 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 is symbolic to supplicating. It is, I didn't say suffocating. 
supplicating. Supplicating means that you're praying continuously and you're praying intensely. It means that worship, we've been worshiped. This word prayer means worship. So what he's saying is when we get to our worship time, we don't forget to pray for you. When we get to the point where we're really calling on God with great intensity, we are praying for you. We got to learn to pray for people. And we can't get down there on our knees or laying in our bed or walking in the street and say, Lord, have mercy every time. We ought to spend some time along with the Lord, asking the Lord to bless them, Lord, heal them, Lord, keep them, Lord. We ought to be praying for each other. Yes, Lord. So he says, he says that, that we have been asking that you may be filled with the knowledge that you may be filled with discernment. This word knowledge means discernment. This word knowledge means recognition. This word knowledge means to be in acknowledgement. He says, we've been praying for you and we are praying that you be filled up to the brim with the knowledge of God's will, with the knowledge of his will. The word will means his desire, God's pleasure. God's choice, God's purpose, and God's decree. I hear people all the time say, I decree it to be so. Let me tell you, I'd rather for God to decree it to be so than for man to decree it to be so. It's our job to make sure we pray. It's our job to make sure we pray with intensity. It's our job to make sure we call upon the name of the Lord and be a blessing to other people because we're keeping them before the Lord. Don't wait till they get sick to pray for them. Mm -hmm. You ought to pray for them when they're sick, but you ought to pray intensively even if they're not sick. He says that we, we've been praying for you and we're praying that God fills you with knowledge, with a spirit of discernment that you can have a great discernment of things going on around you. <laughs> you got you to gotta make sure that we pray and call out people named before the Lord and, and, and the knowledge of his will, that they will be able to discern what God has decreed. We have too many false prophets that are telling people too many lies, that are, that are prophesying and prophet lying to people, and people are falling head over heel off the cliff because of it. We have too many people that are proclaiming things and decreeing things that God does not decree. Yes. We have to make sure that whatever we call out is in the word of God, and it came out the mouth of God, it is God-breathed. For God has decreed. So Paul says to this church at Colossae that we've been praying for you that you be filled with all discernment, all knowledge of God's will, of God's decree in, in wisdom and spiritual understanding. In other words, this word wisdom in this particular text means clarity. We ought to be praying for each other that God will give us clarity. We ought to pray for direction for each other. We ought to keep each other lifted up in prayer in such a way that we have an understanding of where God is leading us. We ought to pray for direction. God, give me direction. God, you ought not wake up any morning with your plans laid out without asking God to give you direction. We ought to make sure that God gives us direction. So this word wisdom here in this sense means clarity. God, we ought to be praying that God gives us wisdom and give others wisdom, give others clarity and spiritual understanding. We ought to be praying for each other that God gives us clarity, spiritual understanding. This word spiritual means the supernatural heard somebody say the other day that God want to put some, some super on your natural. In other words, God wants to, we ought to be praying that God gives someone a spiritual lifestyle, a supernatural, a divine lifestyle. This word spiritual means not carnal. 
The word carnal means that you are saved. You're born again, but you're living like you're not saved and like you're not born again. So he's saying that we are praying that God gives you a spiritual understanding, a supernatural understanding, a divine understanding, a not carnal, a not human, but a regenerate understanding, a God-breathed understanding. We have to get to a point in our lives where we pray for people and we get a spiritual understanding. We need a spiritual understanding because this spiritual understanding is supernatural. That's why Paul says in Corinthians, don't even bother to talk to the natural man about those things that are spiritual. Because the things that are spiritual, they are spiritually designed. Those things who are, that are spiritual, the natural man would never understand. I'm glad you asked, who is the natural man? The natural man is a person born out of his mother's womb on his way to hell. If he doesn't receive Jesus Christ, he is going to hell. He is a natural man. He is an unsaved man. He is a man that has no super on his natural. He's a natural man. My question to you today, are you supernatural? My question to you today, have God changed you? Have you been regenerated? This word spiritual means a regenerate man, somebody that God has breathed upon by way of his Holy Spirit. Let me just stop here and say this now. Don't let another man breathe upon you, especially during COVID-19. There are too many preachers all over this world that's breathing on people, talking about God is breathing on you. You need the Holy Spirit himself to breathe on you, not through another man. Ooh-wee. I'm going to get some emails now. You need God to breathe on you. And many times God breathed on you, not in a coliseum, but while you're all by yourself talking to God. God breathed on me. And let me just, just park here while I'm here. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, the Holy Spirit comes in at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to get in another line, get hands put on you. You may get hands put on you for prayer and that's fine, but you don't need to get in another line for a man to lay hands on you for you to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the gift of the Holy Spirit came in when the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God came in at one time. Yes. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, are you allowing him to be activated? Are you allowing him to lead, guide, and control your every move? Allow God, allow God, the Holy Spirit, to control your every move. So he says, we're praying that you become spiritual and you have spiritual understanding in verse number nine. This word understanding is intellect. The word understanding is to, to mentally put together. The word understanding deals with your intelligence. And let me just tell you, my brother and sister, you do not have to become dumb because you're saved. Right. You can still use your five senses even after you're saved. You can still smell, taste. You can still use your brain for thinking after you're saved. Paul is saying here, God makes us supernatural spiritual creatures. He makes us supernatural spiritual creatures, but he gives us understanding, meaning he still gives us intellect. God delivered me from the preacher who says, I don't have to study because the Bible says that he will give me what to say at the time to say it. Right. Well, let me tell you, when the Bible says that, it's talking about in the midst of, of a tense situation. It's talking about in the midst of a dispute. And in the midst of a dispute, God will give you what to say and how to be quiet in the midst of a dispute. But if you don't study his word and you don't put anything in, nothing can come up and nothing can come out. Yes. Therefore, whatever comes out is what you put in. If I squeeze a limer, 
A lemon, nothing is coming out of that lemon but lemon juice. Apple juice don't come out of a lemon. So you have to put something in. God deliver me from preachers who have declared that I don't have to be enrolled in any school. God speaks directly to me. Yeah, he does. Read the book of Hebrews. It says, in, in, in those days, in sundry times, in, in those times past, God spoke directly to, through the man, and now God is speaking by way of his word, yes. by way of his Holy Spirit, by way of Jesus Christ. But, you know, we say these things that we got a rhema word from the Lord that no one else can, can have because we've come to the conclusion that we are higher than anybody else. Don't let people fool you. Don't, don't let people fool you because the bottom line, the bottom line is God talking to all of us the same way. Amen. He's speaking through his word. And you ought to be studying and reading his word. So Paul says that we are praying for your spiritual understanding. This word spiritual understanding means your supernatural intelligence, your supernatural intellect. And that's what Paul says right here in, in, in chapter one of Colossians, uh, verse number nine. He says that we've heard about you. <clears throat> and for this reason, because you are on the right track for this reason, We've been praying for you. We've been supplicating for you. We've been worshiping God. And in the midst of our worship, we've been praying for God, praying to God for you and praying to God and thanking him for you. That God will give you his will. He will give you knowledge and understanding that God will give you spiritual, supernatural understanding. Verse number 10, Paul continues and says, the other thing we're praying for you concerning is that God will do some blessed things in your life that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He says, he says now, we're praying for you that you have spiritual understanding that you have supernatural intellect. And you see, the natural man and the carnal man cannot have supernatural intellect. They have to get it from God. And so the only way for them to get it from God is that they become spiritual men. And if you become spiritual men and spiritual women, then God speaks to you in a supernatural way, and it always agrees with his word. Yes. So verse 10 says, we're also praying that you may walk, <laughs> that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Now, this word walk is not putting one foot in front of the other. This word walk means that he wants you to live. This word walk means to depart oneself and to follow Christ Jesus. This word walk is your lifestyle. It, it is how you make up yourself in your daily life. It is synonymous to the word that is often used in the Bible called your conversation. Mm -hmm. This word walk, your conversation, means how you live in your lifestyle. Your lifestyle ought to line up with what you believe. Mm -hmm. And what you believe ought to show them Jesus Christ. And what you believe ought to be something that's worthy unto the Lord. Look at what he says in verse number 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Let me just tell you, this word worthy means appropriately. This word worthy means that you're walking godly. This word worthy doesn't mean that you are worthy because none of us are worthy. It takes Jesus to make us worthy. None of us deserve to even be living right now. It's only because of what God has done through his amazing grace and through his precious mercies that we receive every morning and every day and all during the day. The Bible teaches that every morning there are new mercies every morning. Yes. And God has given us new mercy. You can't say God woke you up this morning and he woke you up last Friday and that's just one mercy. Let me tell you, God is passing out mercies, new mercies every morning. He's giving it to you every day. 
He's giving it to you all during the day. And because we are not worthy, we need one who make us worthy. His name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He says that you need to live. You need to walk. You need to, to have a lifestyle of following Jesus that is worthy and appropriate unto the Lord. This word Lord, this word Lord is controller. This word Lord is supreme in authority. Jesus ought to be supreme in authority in your life. He ought to be the one who can control you, who is your master. We are slaves to him. Paul often opened up his letter by saying that I'm a slave unto Jesus Christ. He says, I'm a servant unto Jesus Christ. I'm not only a servant, I'm a bond servant unto Jesus Christ. Let me just share with you, if you're not a slave to Jesus, you're a slave to the devil. Yes. If you're not a servant to Jesus, you are a servant to the devil. It's not, it's not um, Napoleon ice cream where, where you can pick and choose one of the three. It's only Jesus or the devil. It's only God or Satan. It's only God or Lucifer. When you're a carnal, you, you straddle that fence. And when you're carnal, you, you don't let God lead you. God is looking to be your Lord. Jesus is looking to be your Lord and your Savior. Yes. The word Lord means controller. The word Lord means supreme in authority. Is he supreme in authority in your life? Has he taken over your life to a point where you, you, lay, you lay what you want to do down so you can do what he wants you to do? That's when Jesus is supreme in authority. You got to let him be supreme in authority. He needs to be supreme in authority. You got to allow him to do that. He didn't, he didn't walk up and kick the door down and walk in the door and, and, and make you lay down to him and make you get up to him and make you walk for him. What Jesus does, he tells us the right way and he expects us to follow. Yes. We are the sheep of his pastor and we all follow him. So he says in, in verse number 10, uh, we're praying that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing to him. Fully pleasing. This word pleasing means pleasure. That God will get pleasure out of how you walk. That you will walk worthy in such a way that God will be able to brag about you. <laughs> you remember Job, don't you? Not Job, but Job. You remember Job. Job walk worthy before the Lord. The Bible says that he was a holy man and he was the most righteous man in all of us. He was so righteous until God could brag on him to the devil. And God could suggest Job to the devil. Have you considered my servant Job? Even the devil knew that Job was pleasing to God. Even the devil said, I can't touch Job. I, I can't touch Job because you got a hedge of protection around it. Job. Just lower the hedge and I'll make him cuss you to your face. <laughs> Regardless of what happened to Job, he never cussed God. He never, did, he never walked out on God. He lost 10 children. He stuck with the Lord. He had sores all over his body. He stuck with the Lord. He lost the attention of his wife, but he stuck with the Lord. His wife said, you, you might as well just cuss God and die. Job didn't call her a fool, but he said, you talk as if you are a foolish woman. Yes, so he even lost the, lost the commitment of his wife, but he never, ever cussed God. He said, though he slays me, yet will I trust. Mm -hmm. Will you trust God like that? Will you continue to walk with God in such a way that it's pleasing to the Lord? It is impossible to please the Lord without faith. As we walk through this pandemic, as we walk through bad decisions by leadership, on the federal level, on the state level, and, and some, some cities on the, the local level, will you trust God while bad decisions are being made? Paul says, I'm, I'm praying for you. We're praying for you. That, that you are fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. 
saying that, that we, we're praying for you, that you are being fruitful. This word fruitful means fertile. This word fruit, fruitful means that you're going to produce something. This word fruitful means that you're going to have offsprings. And let me tell you, whether you got children or not, you ought to be devoting your life to making sure that there are some offsprings that receiving God from you, from the way you're walking, from the way you're talking. Yes, sir. I, I was, I was, I was with the guy today and, and, uh, I was just, just listening to him. And if I wasn't really saved, he could have really messed up my day. I mean, every word out of his mouth was a cuss word. And I don't bother to say, hey, stop cussing. I just let him cuss and I keep pointing him to Jesus. And what I want to say to you today is that you walk worthy and circumspectively to the Lord and let your light shine. It is what is known as frangelism, where you evangelize through your lifestyle. When people see you, they see you as one who is walking worthy to the Lord himself. So he says, be fruitful. So fruitful until you are fertile. Until you are so fertile, fertile until other people get blessed because of you. He says, be, be fruitful. Be fertile. Some people are leafy, but they have no fruit. Wow. Some, some number one, it says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor walk, walketh in the seat of the scornful, walketh in the way of the scornful. For his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. I told you, God speaks to us through his word. We ought to meditate in his word day and night. Mm -hmm. Verse number three says, and he will be like a tree. This is Psalm one and three. He will be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. And he gives all fruit. This man that walks with the Lord, this man that loves the Lord, this man that's in the word of the Lord, this man that does not walk with everybody else and get caught up in pure pressure, this man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Mm -hmm. And in that water come all the nutrition he needs. He says to us, we got to be fruitful. And the Bible says in Psalm 1 that his leaves shall not wither. And whatsoever he does, he does shall prosper. Whatsoever he does shall prosper. I'm asking the Lord, Lord, to bless me. Anything I put my hands on, anything I put my mind through, Lord, I ask you to prosper it. Anything I take part in, Lord, I'm asking you to prosper it. Anything I participate in, Lord, Lord, I'm asking you to make it prosper. The Bible says that if I meditate in the, the word of the Lord, if I walk worthy of the Lord, then whatsoever I do will prosper. Goes on to say the ungodly is not so, but it's like this, like the shaft with the wind blows away. Shaft is that stuff that is, is left over. Mm -hmm. Back in the country, back in the country, after we got through shelling peas, you would see the women go outside and they would put put the put the uh, the butter beans and and put the rice and the wheat in in a sheet. And one would get on one end, one would get on the other end, and they would take it and they would lift the rice and the and the beans and stuff up in the sheet. Not so violently that it would dump it off, but what would happen is they would they would be sifting. Mm -hmm. They would sift what is good, and what is good will fall back on the sheet, and that which is bad, the shaft will the wind drives it away. Wow. The wind pushes it away. The Bible says the ungodly are not so, but it's like the shaft with the wind driveth away. We want to be fruitful. We got, we got folk who dress up on Sunday, dress up on Wednesday, Tuesday, whatever night. They are leafy. You can see their leaves, but you can't see their fruit. I want every member of the New Beginning Church and every person that listened to me on, on live broadcast to be fruitful. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to be fertile. I want you to bear fruit for the Lord. Verse number 10, he says, fully, it says, 
fully pleasing to God, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Every good work, every beneficial work, every deed that you do, every act that you take part in, every labor that you participate in. The, Paul says, I'm praying for this church at Colossae. He says in chapter one of Colossians, Verse number 10, I'm praying that you continue to be fruitful and I'm, that you be fruitful in every good beneficial work, in every deed. I'm praying that you be fruitful and I'm praying, we are praying that you are increasing in knowledge of God. Increasing means to grow, means to enlarge. He's praying that we, we become increasing in the knowledge. It, it just dis disturbed me. It disturbs me to hear people say, you just got to accept me as I am. I've been this way for several years. You're just going to have to take me as I am. Well, no, we don't have to just take you as you are. Matter of fact, you just need to grow up. We got some people that brag about being in church 40, 50 years and have never grown up yet. It, when, when a person says, you got to take me as I am, i always been this way, that's not anything to brag about. That's, what you just said is that you are a newborn baby and you're 80 years old. Yes. You've been in church for several years. After first year, you shouldn't be like you were when you were first born again. It's time Paul says, I'm praying that you grow up. I'm praying that you get enlarged. I'm praying that you get knowledge, discernment. I'm praying that you get recognition of God. God, the exceeding one. God, the supreme divinity. I'm praying that you get some knowledge in God. The problem today, we got knowledge in a lot of other things, but we don't have knowledge in God. We have to get knowledge in the Lord. Get knowledge in God. We have to get knowledge in the Lord. And, and you have to spend time with God. To get that knowledge. Verse number 11. Verse number 11 says. I'm, I'm praying for you that you be strengthened. Paul says to this church at Colossae. I'm praying that you be strengthened. And I'm praying that you be strengthened with all might. What Paul does here. He uses the same word in the Greek twice. He says I'm praying that you be strengthened. And then he says, I'm praying that you be strengthened in all might. The word strengthen and might are synonymous to each other. First of all, the word strengthen is, we get the word strengthen from the same word. We get the word power. It is in the, it is in the Greek, dunamis. Dunamis power. It is the same word. We get the word dynamite. This word strengthen means to be enabled, to have force, to have the ability. Oftentimes referred to the police officer, good police officers. You see, he has dunamis power and he has excusia power. The dunamis power is the explosive power. It is the power you get from his, from his gun, his taser, from his blackjack. That's dunamis power. The excusia power, it is the power of authority. It is the power that we see from his badge. We see it in his uniform. We, we see it in his cap. It is the authority. It says his authority, his cap, his uniform, his badge. It says that I'm dressed like this because I've been given power from the city, from the state, from the government to do what I do. So in this particular verse, it talks about verse number 11, Colossians chapter 1. It talks about the fact that Paul is praying, praying for their strength, their dunamis power. And then he's saying that you will have all might. This word might is the same word as strength, but it gives more punch to it. He says that I'm praying that you have might. Praying that you have power. And this power, this word might is miracle, wondrous working power. He's a wonderful working God. He's saying that I want you to have power. I'm praying that you have might. I'm praying that you have mighty miracles in your life. 
saying that I'm praying that you do wonderful work and powerful things. Paul says in verse number 10, according to his glorious power. In other words, your power comes because of God's power. Glorious power, power that God honors, glorious power, power that God has praised for, and we ought to praise God because of it. Dignified power, same power we ought to have in worship. It is glorious, worshiping power. And we get this power in worship. You ought not wait till you get to church to worship. Some people during this pandemic has taken off from church. You ought not be taken off from church. Yes, sir. You ought to be having church. You ought to be waiting on, on Wednesday night. You ought to be looking at your clock at 7 o'clock saying, man, when are they going to come on with this? When is church going to start? I am ready for worship. <coughs> on Sunday morning, you ought not lay in the bed. You ought to get up. When is 9 o'clock going to come so they can break down the word through Sunday school? At 1045, you ought to be looking. You ought to be, you ought to, you ought to be restless. You ought to be saying, I want to hear the a word from the Lord, preacher. Preacher, give me the word from the Lord because I know if I hear the word from the Lord, I will have power. According to God's glorious power. This this word power means dominion and strength. So he uses these words three times. Three different ways, three different words. When it talks about God's power, he talks about dominion. God has all dominion. God has all control. God is just God. Yes, and we ought to depend on God to be God. Mm -hmm. We got to stop depending on the legislature and the executive branch to be God. We have to trust God to be God because there is no God like our God. It goes on to say in verse number 11, glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Patience, endurance. Patience. We, we ought to have patience to continue on because when we have patience, we have hope and we're looking forward to something happening. Something going to get better. Back home, we used to march in on the song when I used to sing in the choir. Sister Davis doesn't believe I used to sing in the choir back home. Back home, I used to sing in the choir, and, and, and we used to march in a song. That's when the, the, the old Black Baptist Church, they used to march, the choir used to march down. Right after the devotion, the choir used to march down the center aisle. And then when you got big enough, you, you marched down the walls. And then when you got really big, you marched down the center aisles in the wall. And we used to sing a song, step by step. Step by step, we'll make this journey. Step by step, God will lead us. And then when it really got good to us, we'll talk about through the years, we keep on toiling. <laughs> toiling through the storm and rain. But we always sung and we always prayed like we had hope. Pastor Roger L. Reed would end his sermon by giving us hope. Pastor Billy Ray Love would end his sermon by giving us hope. They were always in with giving us hope. Let me tell you, as a Christian, you need to know that God has given you power to have patience and to endure. Yes. Then he talks about long suffering, long suffering, forbearance. You ought to have love. You ought to be able to put up with some things. As you live for the Lord, as you walk with the Lord, you ought to be able to put up with some things. You ought not be running from church to church because somebody made you mad anymore. You only leave a church when God leads you from the church. The, 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 the cashier made you mad last week. You're right back in Kroger's this week. But when it comes to the church, I ain't got to put up with this. We have to get to a point where we are patient and long-suffering. And then Paul says with joy. We ought to have some joy. We, joy is cheerfulness. Joy is calmness under pressure. We ought to be like the duck. The duck sitting on the water. There's a lot of turbulence going on up under the water. He's kicking like 90, 40. But when you see him on the top, he's just coasting along. That's how every Christian ought to be. We ought to be at a point in our lives where we can coast along, putting our trust in God and have cheerfulness, have joy, 
have calmness. This word joy means to be delightful and to be full. You ever gone to church and you came home and you said, boy, I'm sure full of the day. What it means is I got joy in the Lord. Yes. Paul says, I'm praying for you. Praying for you that you have joy in the Lord. And finally, verse number 12, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 12. I told you we couldn't get through with this whole pericope tonight. So let me end with verse number 12. Paul says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Look at Paul, how he closes this thing out here. He says, giving thanks to the Lord. He said, we giving thanks to the Lord, thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Let me tell you, if you're not saved, you're not qualified. God has qualified us through Jesus Christ. He has qualified us. Even though we are sinful, he looks at us as sinless because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Even though we are not righteous, he commits us to be righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Even though we have fallen short, even though we are constantly falling short, Jesus sees us as righteous because of what he did over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. He qualifies us. He qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. He qualifies us in such a way that we are partakers. This word partaker means that, that we have a portion. This word partaker means that we are, we are, we are provence. This word partakers mean that we are a share. In other words, just like on your job, you have 401k or you have stocks and market values and stuff. What he's saying is you have been acquired by Jesus Christ to be a share of the kingdom of God. We are a share, meaning that we are a participator. We are participators in this great thing called an inheritance. An inheritance mean a lot. An inheritance mean an acquisition. Inheritance mean we are patriots. I want to tell you, we are not people of this world. We are patriots of the other kingdom. We getting out of here. We're going somewhere. And then finally he says, along beside the saints of the light. <laughs> we, we, we got, we're not only the patriots, but there are other folk who are patriots. Oh, 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 John says it like this. He says, I looked and I saw a number. And the number was 144,000. These are the children of Israel. Then he says, and I looked and I saw another number. And I couldn't even count the number. I'm in that number. I'm in the number with the saints. This word saints mean the blameless. And I'm not blameless because, because who I am. I'm not blameless because of what I've done. I'm blameless because of Jesus himself. Yes. I'm blameless because over 2,000 years ago, Jesus took a tree. Jesus took a stick. Jesus took a cross. And he carried up a skull hill called Calvary. He made me blameless because I received him as my Lord. If you're listening to me today, and you don't consider yourself saved, or you don't know if you're saved, or you don't think you're saved, or you don't remember when you received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. Don't you want to be a part of the inheritance? Don't you want to be a, pa a patron to the, to the other kingdom on the other side? Jesus has paid the price for us. We are partakers in his inheritance. Yes. We are partakers to the lot. We are partakers to the acquisition and we are patriots to the other kingdom. You see, one of these days, this world as we know it is going to be over. It's going to be worse than, than it is now. It's going to be worse than, than we see it. It's going to be worse than the coronavirus. But I'm not really worried about that now. <laughs> I, I've seen what's going to happen. And when, when, when I was in school, they don't do this anymore, I'm sure, because they got internet everywhere now and they, everything is electronically driven. But when I was in school and I had a book report to do, I went to the library 
And the librarian helped me one day. The librarian said, come on over here with me. And she took me into the corner and she looked through the catalog. And she looked through the catalog and found the book. And once she found the book, she took me to the shelf and showed me the book. But while we were in the catalog, not only did she show me the book, but there was a thing right beside the book called Cliff Notes. She showed me the Cliff Notes. And when she showed me the cliff note, what the cliff notes were, they were summaries of the whole book. And what she said to me, if you're going to do a book report, you don't have to go and read the whole book. Because chapter by chapter, the author has created cliff notes, and these cliff notes give you a summary of every chapter. What I'm trying to tell you today is that I've looked at the end of the book, and I've looked at the summary of the book. And the summary says that I'm going to be along with the blameless. I'm going to be along with those who have received Jesus Christ, and I'm on my way to heaven. Yes. I want to say to you today, you can go to heaven. I, I'm going to say to you today that you don't have to hang around here on earth. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 9, there will be one day when there will be people who will be running because there will be some locusts. And these locusts will be built like horses and they will have tails that will sting men, that will be stinging men for five months. And men will want to die. Yeah. Women and children will want to die because the sting is so awful. They will want to die and they cannot die because death will be on the run. That's Revelation chapter, chapter 9. It says that men will want to die. They'll jump off tall buildings, want to die, and they can't die. Wow. They will walk in front of 18 wheelers. they flatten them to the ground like the road runner, and they cannot die. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go through Revelation chapter 9. You can get out of here in Revelation chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Because in Revelation chapter 4, John says that I looked and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He says, I looked into heaven and I saw this great crowd of people. He says, I saw jasper walls. I, I, saw, I saw the fact that there would be no more crying and no more dying. He says, I saw a beautiful city. I saw the throne of God. You can get out of here in Revelation chapter 4. You don't have to hang around in Revelation chapter 9. But the only way for you to do that, you must be. You got to be. You have to be born again. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. Don't wait till Sunday. You can't afford to wait. People are getting out of here every day. You need to trust Jesus tonight. Invite him into your life that you can be a patriot for the kingdom on the other side. The door of the church is open. If you believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried in a barbed tomb, and then he rose from the dead. You can be saved right here, right now. While blood is yet running warm in your vein, you can be born again. All you have to do is repeat after me in this short little simple prayer. I want to lead you in prayer. And you can invite Christ into your life. The only thing you're going to say is, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Will you join me in prayer? Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. We believe that if you honestly prayed that prayer, trusting that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins and rose again, we believe that you're born again. You ought to involve yourself in a good Bible teaching church. I recommend this one, New Beginning Church, where Jesus Christ is the reason for our being. 
For Jesus Christ is the captain of the ship. For Jesus Christ is the one who makes us well. And those of you who don't have a church home or you in between church homes, I recommend the New Beginning Church. If you've received Christ tonight, inbox me and let me know so we can rejoice together. And if you want a church home, you want to be a part of a good church, inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We'll be glad to have you. We look forward to the day where we can celebrate together in person. Thank you for joining us tonight. It is now offering time. Hallelujah. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gift. It is offering time. It is offering. It is offering time. <clears throat> you can give by three ways, three different means. You can give by cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. You can give by cash tag. Um, cash tag is dollar sign NBC Souls. <clears throat> Or you can give by Zelle. You can give by Zelle. You can give by Zelle. You can give by Zelle by the email lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your offering. You can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Please give, please continue to give that we will continue to operate under your financial gifts. Thank you for joining us here tonight for our Bible study at 7.20 p.m., 7.20 p.m. every Wednesday. We'll be right here on these two stations by Zoom and, and by Facebook Live. Uh, please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. We'll be glad to have you a part of our Sunday school, these same two channels. And then our worship service at 10.45 a.m., our worship service. Please join us every Sunday for our worship service at 10.45 a.m. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We enjoyed having you with us here tonight, and we look forward to our time together on Saturday, on Sunday morning. Amen. We look forward to our time together on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock a.m. for our Bible study. Let's keep praying for the church. Pray for your pastor, whoever your pastor may be. Pray for Matthew A. Davis and pray for every pastor because we're making some tough decisions now and uh, we're having some bad information given to us. But we want to keep the congregation safe and we want to make sure that we do all we can to be a blessing to the people of God. Continue to be blameless, continue to walk with the Lord, and continue to obey Him and walk with Him. Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you now for this time together. We thank you that we can walk worthy, that we can walk worthy because of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father God, for advising us and keeping us, for ministering to us through your word tonight. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us and bless us to be about your business and doing those things that are pleasing in your sight. Forgive us for our sins, that our sins will not hinder our blessings, and that our sins will not disconnect us from you. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. And bless the name of Jesus the Christ. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. <clears throat>